Hey everybody, welcome back. It's Siobhan and we're here for another game programming topic. Today we're going to be talking about netcode, or at least that's what the gamers like to call it. Um, network programming, anything under the sun that has to do with creating programming that allows you to transfer information over the web. We call it netcode, I guess. Um, anyways, colloquially. So what I wanted to talk about is that um, a lot of people, a lot of game developers, budding game developers, have this beautiful idea of a game that they want to make, and it has to be network programming. It has to have multiplayer in it, like network multiplayer in it. And uh, they're not going to settle for anything else, and they're so ambitious, and they're so motivated, and this, when there's a will, there's a way, and they're so excited to get into it. And you're like, network programming's kind of hard, and they're like, I don't care, I'll figure it out, you know, or something like that. And, you know, power to them. But then they get into it a little bit and they start to see all these different things like, oh wait, you need uh, player authentication or something like that, you know, to be able to sign in and all that kind of stuff. And oh wait, matchmaking? Oh shoot, matchmaking. And then what else do we got? You got um, achievement systems, right? Achievement systems and trophies or whatever the heck. Um, and then they notice like, oh my gosh, there's all these like servers, you know, uh, game servers to choose from, uh, like, you know, there's AWS, like Amazon Web Services, or like Microsoft Azure Playfab, or whatever the heck it's called nowadays, and then there's a whole bunch of other different ones out there, and like, which one do I choose, and what the heck, and then they actually start going into the, like, trying to learn how to do this, like, network programming thing, and um, what they find themselves up against is, like, there's just it's an incredibly overwhelming type of thing. It's like there's all sorts of different, you know, game engines with their different modules and things like that. So for Unity, there's like Mirror, but there's also Photon, and then there's maybe Spatial OS, and then like Unity is always having some kind of existential crisis about what they're doing with their network programming. So now it's like, well, we're going to do ML API, whatever the heck that means, and then you're going to get into it, and hopefully we're not going to, you know, deprecate it soon or something like that. And then there's Unreal and all their awesome stuff that's built in. Everyone's like, oh, just use Unreal if you're going to do, you know, network programming. And you're like, but I only know Unity. You know, there's all sorts of these types of things, and you start getting stressed out. And it doesn't matter how, like, motivated you are at the start when there's a will, there's a way. You just become overwhelmed, and then you might just totally give up game development altogether because you can't make your magnum opus game that you've had in your mind since you were a fifth grader maybe you are still a fifth grader hi you know i don't know but the point here is that um it can be overwhelming so i want to step back because most of the videos that i see online seem to be about like well how do you you know set up amazon web services or how do you use mirror or some tutorial or something like that so i'm not gonna get into that you know, there's all sorts of fun stuff, and then there's also these talks where it's like, look at the magic of network programming, and frankly, it is kind of like a magic, you know what I mean? It's more of a magic than it is a science or an art, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's more magic than anything. Uh, and there's these crazy videos like, look how they put together Overwatch or, you know, you know, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 6 or something like that, and you're always like, wow, that's so cool, and then you think about it and you're like, that looks really hard, right? Um, so I, I want to take a step back from all of that um, in this particular uh, video, and I want to just, you know, ask the question, like, what do you actually need to know? What do you need to learn? What do you need to implement? And the best answer to that is always the least amount possible, unless you're trying to get a job, like, you know, knowing everything or something like that. But if you're trying to make your own game, you just go with the least amount that you need, because with all of these different systems, authentication, matchmaking, achievements, game servers, blah, blah, blah. Um, each of those, supposing you're not going to try to s roll your own, set up your own, each of those is like a different, uh, y totally different company, you know, with a different so set of services, and you're going to be making a game over a few years, and some of these are going to be like changing things up, and now you can't afford it anymore, and oh, shoot. And, you know, some of it you can't avoid, but some of it you can. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. So um, what often happens is that someone has like kind of a single player game that they want to make, and then they're like halfway through the game's development, or even earlier, they're like, you know, it'd be cool. What if it was like multiplayer? You know, that, that always happens, right? It doesn't matter what game you're making, right? You can even make solitaire. It's called solitaire. And you're like, at some, way, at some point, you're like, what if this was a multiplayer solitaire? You know, or something like that. You know, it, it happens. So, um, you know, let's, penguins, it's the topic of the day, right? So everyone's talking about penguins nowadays, right? So let's say um, that we're going to make a game about penguins. Um, it'll be called, I don't know, Frizo the Penguin. You know, something like that. And in this game, there's like, water 
And there's a penguin, and I'm going to attempt to draw this penguin. Here it is, kind of swimming along. Yay, it's kind of diving down. It's got a little eye. And, uh, and it kind of swims, right? It goes, wee, and then it kind of goes down into the ocean and it avoids sharks, and it does fun stuff like that. And, of course, what do birds always like? They like uh, shiny stuff. So there's, like, gems down in the bottom of the ocean or something like that for some reason. Um, you got to collect all the gems, right? And then you... Uh, I don't know. You, you bring them back and you try not to eat, get eaten by a shark or something like that. Um, and you're making this this game. It's, it's very cool. Who knows? It's bling, maybe it's Blingo the penguin trying to get all blinged up. So, uh, let's say that you want to make it so that there's some kind of uh, engagement with other players on the internet. Well, um, there's a number of different ways you can do this, and one of the most basic ways to do it is having a leaderboard. A leaderboard is a relatively simple kind of thing to be able to implement in your game. And so when you start looking at, like, well, how do I do the network programming stuff? You get, again, confronted by all that, you know, get this incredibly advanced solution or, you know, access this, you know, like, buy this server space or whatever it is. Uh, like, but let's talk about like what is it. So before we go into that, let's just first understand a couple of terms um, to make sure that we're all on the same page. So let's say that we have a game, and I'm going to represent this game with a game controller. I guess that's what a game controller looks like, and it's going to have four buttons like usual, and has a D-pad like usual, and I'm going to like draw a box around it so it's like this is the game software and um, game software. We're going to call this the client. So the game itself, the software, you know, that that we would describe as the game is the client, right? So that's what the player plays on on their, you know, PlayStation or Xbox or computer at home. And then in order to be able to share information with other players on the Internet, there is something that we call a server, right? So I'm going to draw a server. It's usually represented as a box with like a bunch of lines because each line represents like a hard drive or something like that. There's a lot of hard drives. You know, servers store a lot of information. And I'm also going to also attach to the server, and it's really just part of the server. Is <laughs> pardon me, this is beautiful. It's the it's the database. <laughs> okay, so the database is really just part of the server software. Um, but I just want to you know just draw them both so that we can talk about them both. So there's the server, and then here's the database, which is just part of the server. Very good. It stores information in the server. Not only runs software, you know, processes requests by the clients, um, but it also has a database in which it stores um, various pieces of information. All right, so we have a client, and the client is running the game software. And in this particular case, we want to make a leaderboard. So what happens is the client says, "Yo, I want to upload my amazing score that I just got." And um, the server is the one that receives that request. So the client's like, hey, I got this really cool score. Um, check it out. And then the server will do a few different things, right? The server, one, verifies if, the serv if, the, um, if that score is worthy of being put in the high score database, right? If it is not, then it won't put it in the high score database. Um, maybe the server will keep track of what your high score was on the internet so that other players can at least see what your high score was or something like that. So whether it puts in a high score database or just saves it for you, the, the point is you're going to need some amount of player authentication. Okay, that's going to happen because the server needs to have some way of recognizing the player, recognizing who, like who this client is, right? And so there has to be some kind of form of signing in. Now, a lot of these types of platforms, like Xbox has their Xbox Live service, there's Steam, there's uh, you know PlayStation, and each of them have their own what we call an API, right? So there's an application. Let's <laughs> just all the way down here. Whoopsie diddle. All right, uh, API. API. All right. So. Application programming interface, basically what the API uh, allows you to do is it's um, a set of tools that a, a service will provide that allows other computers to be able to request certain information from that particular set of services. So specifically, if you want to be able to log in, like associate your game with some kind of Steam account or something like that, to be able to log in to some kind of Steam, um, you know, 
achievements and steam you know the, the player information all the kind of stuff that steam gives you same thing with xbox live um there's an api which the game engine or if you're not using a game engine that you use in order to be able to connect to it and authenticate and say oh, okay i'm logged into steam etc okay um that's all very advanced i don't want to talk about that too much right now in fact i'm getting into the weeds the point here is that you're gonna have to do some kind of login right so i'm gonna put this up here next to player authentication so there is this process where the client, you know, logs in to the API and then the server is able to, you know, check to make sure, okay, great, you're in that, you're in a particular session where you are logged in um, through Xbox or Steam or whatever it might be. But I'm just mentioning that because there's really no way you're going to be able to avoid that step regardless, because with the leaderboard, like it has to know who you are. So you could create your own login system and have that just kind of like this proprietary, low, you know, just your particular leaderboard thing. And you have to have like a username and password or whatever the heck. But usually that's not the case much anymore. So um, the client then you know, sends this uh, this high score to the server. And here's the big issue, because sure, the server can be like, that's not a high score, so too bad, noob, or whatever the heck the server will tell the client. Um, but what also happens is the server, in order to make it so that other players want to have any motivation to try to beat the high score, they need to prevent the client from sending a score like 9999999999. LOL, right? Um, because if the server receives this information from the client and just trusts the client blindly, then the server is going to be like, okay, and then we'll just, you know, put that in the database. And no, everyone knows that that person was hacking or, you know, cheating. And so then they don't have much motivation to, to do this whole, you know, leaderboard thing. So the server has to have some way of verifying, hey, was that score even real? And there's a number of different ways to do that. I'm not going to be talking about them right now. Okay, so the server checks for cheating. I don't know how to write that, you know, checks for cheating, because that's going to happen a lot, right? Checks for cheating. Did I do exactly the same? There we go. <laughs> checks for cheating. Blah, right on the server. Um, and that's a huge part, right? Because guess what? Here's a secret that not a lot of you know about yet, but people are the worst, okay? It's since the dawn of time. since Well, the dawn of humans or whatever, right? That's like been one constant for all of us that just if we if we're allowed to cheat we'll do it and it's the worst and you just have to expect people are going to do it all right it's, it's pretty sad so a number of ways you can do it right there's uh there's a few different ways you can check to see like is it even possible to get a score like that if not like you can you just have that written in the server so i want to now talk about the server itself so when we're talking about a server a lot of people are like oh it's like a game server dedicated server dedicated server something like that when we're talking about games well yes but you know what does that even mean so we we mentioned this whole aws azure play fab and all that kind of stuff that those types of servers are, well aws hosts a bunch of different types of servers but the point is that when you think of a dedicated server and you're talking about like you know call of duty modern for six or whatever that i was talking about before um those kinds of servers something it even uses dedicated servers anyways those kinds of servers um are a lot more heavy duty and they're processing real-time concurrent network multiplayer okay so this kind of server right here we can think of it more just like a simple web server that hosts websites and it doesn't have to be more complicated than that it really doesn't so when the client access uh you know sends this information to the server it'll do so in the cheapest easiest simplest not like doing this expensive azure play fab stuff not to say it's particularly expensive unless it scales larger um you would use what is called a rest a rest api gosh i'm using too many abbreviations and acronyms and stuff like that but basically um if you know anything about web development you know that there's this whole http thing right where you you know a web page requests uh, some kind of web documents in order to be able to display a render a web page on side of the uh, you know inside of your web browser well it does so uh, often with this rest api where it makes that request to the server and the server gives it back some kind of payload of wonderful junk so the rest api is very simple compared to most of this game net code all right incredibly simple it just sends out just a basic little bit of information in this case just like the high score and that's it right it's just the high score like along with who the player is and then the server is going to check you know like what the level is you know just some little packet of information and then the server will then um the, written in some kind of language right so uh the server could be an apache server it could be node.js it could be one of these types of servers but 
and it's going to be some kind of, let's just say PHP, right? Because you guys have heard PHP. PHP is like a popular server-side scripting language. Um, so this could be a PHP, uh, you know, Python, Perl, like who the heck cares? I just wanted to put the P's out there. So <laughs> I'll just put it right on the server again. PHP, uh, which is a lot easier than uh, a lot of the type of net code you'd be writing because all the PHP is doing is saying like, oh, code? Okay, cool. And then you just create like a set of um, rules inside of the server to verify if that score looks suspicious or other ways of checking to see if like something lines up with like was the configuration modified in the client or just some ways and there's a lot of the ways to do that but i'm not gonna worry about it right now just the point is it's very it's relatively simple and then the php script then says like oh, okay and then put it inside of the database and that's it and it's done and then whatever the client or all the clients let's say there's multiple clients right so there's another one right here right and this person is playing uh with a with a controller that has like a gigantic analog stick and this one too it's almost like like an fpv drone or something like that you know it's just two analog sticks that's the whole controller all right who knows what the heck why the heck they're playing with that but i guess well you know frizo the, the penguin you know seems like a reasonable thing all right but the point is that for this for everyone to be able to know like what is that high score they're all going to get that information from the server, which is going to access it from the database and give it to them. And it's it's really relatively simple code. OK, awesome. I know we talked a lot about this particular thing, but we can go a little bit faster because we uh, now understand this whole relationship relatively well. So um, let's go on. And then let's say this game developer is like, no, leaderboards isn't good enough. You know, I want the player to actually like be playing against other players, not just through like a leaderboard. And so um, they might say, like, I want concurrent multiplayer. So you, you hear this idea of like concurrent concurrency, right? Concurrent multiplayer um, of some kind. <clears throat> But even so, you don't have to make it as complicated as, depending on the game, as uh, you might think, right? If you search concurrent multiplayer, you know, network code, it's like, holy moly, it's the same old stuff. It's the same old song and dance with like the mirror and the photo and all that kind of stuff. But you can design the game in such a way that you don't necessarily need all of that. So let's say that this next game that we're creating, let's, uh, what should we call it? Belly borders right and so it's another penguin game belly borders and in this game uh you play as a penguin that's racing down a mountain and that are there mountains where penguins live like i i don't know we're gonna go with it all right so here's the, the penguin so it's kind of like got its little floppy arms it's got its little flappy tail you know or something like that maybe even has little feet and it's got those little eyes and oof this is the worst thing i've ever drawn no, it isn't. All right, so in here it's got a it's black it's back. I don't know what penguins look like. Anyway, so it's going down the hill, and it's kind of like Ski Free. Have you ever played Ski Free, that game where you play as like a little skier? It's like 2D. It's like Windows 95, and that game was like the worst game ever until some genius game designer was like, you know, we can make this game a little more exciting. We're going to make like just out of nowhere, totally like you'd have no way of anticipating exactly when it happens. Um, or at least it felt that way when, for me when I was a little child. Um, this is like Yeti, this like abominable snowman comes out and just murders you. It's horrible, but it's awesome. All right, anyways. And so you're just avoiding rocks or, you know, the greatest nemesis for, for penguins, like, I don't know, um, nuclear bombs, like whatever penguins are afraid of. And you're just like, woo, and you're avoiding stuff and you're also going like through these little flags, you know, it's just like ski free. And this one has like a number on it, like two. Whatever, so it's a game, and you're and you're, and you're you're playing as a penguin that's racing down the mountain. It's top down, whatever, who cares? It's and it's a relatively simple game. So why would you complicate it with all sorts of like complicated programming and stuff? So in this particular game, Belly Borders, let's say that for this game, you want it to feel like there's concurrent multiplayer, but you want it to be as simple as possible. So what you might be doing instead is using um, a technique called ghost data. Okay, <laughs> ghost data. Ooh, it sounds spooky. There's magic and ghosts involved in network programming. So ghost data is basically what happens is that um, other players around the world, or maybe like they're not really players, they're just like a bot that you know pretends like it was a player. But anyways, the other players around the world um, attempt this particular level, this circuit, and it's exactly the same circuit, the same level as um, what the current player is playing. And the, they take these other players and they record that 
session of the other player. Okay, what I recommend that you do is check out the video on Tutemic here um, called serialization, where we talk about serialization, because this is this is kind of important for this particular topic. So basically, when you race down the hill, the game is logging essentially a replay, right? Um, a sequence of locations that the penguin, you know, is traveling, as well as its its you know velocity and direction. So right, so every you know, half a second or something like that. Um, the game is storing the, the location of the, the, the penguin, its like direction it, and its speed, and um, boom, that's your ghost data file, and you can then replay it. So anytime you're cr creating some kind of like, you know, replay where you can see what happened, rewind, fast forward, um, as soon as you've done that, you can now do network programming with the, the whole ghost data thing because you have a file. It's the serialized file that you can replay through the client side software that can just re just play the sequence of positions and velocities and all the way down but when it comes to concurrent multiplayer what you're doing is you're simulating this idea of concurrency by playing this replay while you are playing so this person who has this high score has this penguin and it's like i'm going to just draw like you know that oh golly that's the worst penguin i've ever seen in my life all right we're going to erase that that was awful enough this one's going to be like, you know, red or something like that. Anyway, so there's a penguin. It's also got little fins. It's also got the little back and all that kind of fun stuff. And so this is your nemesis. This is the other player that's playing. Um, but really, they're not playing at the exact same time. Um, they're just you're just playing a replay of them as you're playing so that you can play against their best time. OK, so that's what Ghost Data is. And it's common in racing games like Gran Turismo, probably in Forza, Mario Kart, those kinds of games. But you also see this kind of thing in a lot of mobile games. OK, because mobile games, the problem with mobile games is that um, you're playing them like while you're waiting for the bus or something like that. It's like the bus is here and you got to like hit pause because, you know, it's like even if it's only like a one minute match, like you're always going to be interrupted in one minute or some reason like that. It's like you're playing it on the toilet and someone's like, I need to go. And, you know, you're like, oh, shoot. And then you hit pause. And then the, the if you're playing multiplayer mode and then it's like pausing it for them, too, it's like, yeah, suspicious. We're not actually playing against this person. So a lot of multiplayer multiplayer mobile app games are really not. They're just doing this whole ghost data thing, like, you know, Plants vs. Zombies. And in fact, a lot of these games, the ghost data isn't as complicated as, like, you know, player positions and location, you know, and, uh, you know, rotation and, like, speed and all that kind of stuff. Like, a game like Plants vs. Zombies, like, you don't even see what the other player is doing. All, all it sends to the server <laughs> in, in the form of ghost data is just, like, a series of numbers in, like, half-second intervals or, like, two-second intervals even. Like, you know what I mean? And it's just, like, uh, just, a, just a little list of numbers, right? And so it's the, exactly the same as the leaderboard, except it feels more concurrent. All you're doing is you're sending over to this server, this basic PHP server. It's just like, here we go, and it's just this ghost data file. It's just this serialized file. It's just like a, you know, like the text document, basically. And uh, it's like, OK. And then it verifies that it's like for real, right? If they're not cheating. And their way to do that is like maybe there'll be like flag uh, two. And then there's also flag three, maybe. And then maybe in your wonderful like PHP file or something like that. Um, that's a three. Um, it says like, what is the fastest you can go between checkpoint two and three? You know, just like physically the fastest you could possibly do it. Just, you know, some basic information. And if that ghost data, like, makes it between those two checkpoints faster than that, then you're like, all right, they're cheating. You know, something like that. There's, a, again, there's even better ways to be able to show that you're cheating, but I don't want to get into it. So the point here is the same as the leaderboard thing, except in the form of, like, the, the score and the ghost data. So you can do this kind of fun stuff. All right, neat. So again, you didn't need anything super special and complicated. You just needed to know some very basic like server code, server side scripting to just accept some like request and then process it and send it back and you're good. All right. Um, and it's not it's not happening like in real time. It just sends the whole ghost data file and then the client, this client runs the game, runs that ghost data. Um, not like just from the server every second, just it just gets the whole file and it runs it, right? So that's pretty cool. And it's very cheap. It's very inexpensive. All right, so um, coming back. So let's say that the player is, uh, you know, is like, no, 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 I actually want active multiplayer. We're actually playing against a real human being, right? Or a real penguin. Like you're playing against a real live creature. Um, 
and this concurrent data thing, the concurrent, you know, like the ghost data thing isn't cutting it. So how do you do that? Well, you can still design a game that doesn't necessarily require this kind of stuff. You could still go with this paradigm, with this whole, like, uh, you know, you don't need very much. So let's talk about that. Uh, so for example, let's say that we're creating Penguin Chess, the most creative name of all games. Penguin Chess. And, you know, you always have to make, like, a new version of chess every few minutes. All right, and then in this game, like, you know, I'm not going to waste too much time drawing 64 squares. But, you know, there's like a bunch of lines, and then there's a bunch of these. It's like 8 by 8. That's not... Who cares, right? So there's penguins. And then um, there's going to be the rooks. What what are the rooks? They're, they're the they're rook hopper. Rook hopper penguins. You know what I'm saying? Any of you guys you know about those penguin species? And it's got like, you know, that little like frilly hair. Is that right? The rock hopper penguins have the frilly hair? I don't care. Rooks. Okay, um, the... Hmm, who should be a king? What species should be the king? I don't know, um, some other type of penguin. <clears throat> so, anyways, so you got your pen, your chess game, and I, I, I trust that many of you know what chess is. But the point about this is like, yeah, you want to be able to do concurrent, like, uh, sorry, like active multiplayer where you're playing against somebody else. But here in this particular game, do you really need all that, like, uh, like a dedicated server that's sitting there, like, waiting for the player's next move? It's like oh, I'm gonna wait and then just like validate every single move, like, as they come in slowly. Like, I mean, that's basically what you're doing, but you're just doing it a lot less expensive by just doing this whole business that we had talked about. It's the same thing. So if you're creating a game like Penguin Chess, and it's turn-based, right? Um, and it's determined... Uh, okay, in another... <laughs> I think it's also in the serialized uh, uh, two-time talk where we talked about um, deterministic you know, algorithms and stuff the command pattern, go watch that video. But the, the, the point here is that um, in a game like this, in a turn-based game like you know, Scrabble Online or whatever the heck that game is, or Penguin Chess or any number of different, you know, Hearthstone clone or whatever, um, those types of games, if it's turn-based, then basically what the server can do is that for every turn that the player does, every action that the player completes, it will send it over to the server. And the server doesn't have to be this fancy thing that's like running this instance of the game on the server, you know, that is replicates the the state across both clients at this, you know, simultaneously and all that fun stuff. You don't need all that fancy junk. You can still have your basic PHP server, and uh, it just the client comes over here. And I'm not advocating like use PHP. I'm just saying like it doesn't need to be a like large application that's being run in your, uh, you know, can can continuously for just a simple turn-based game between two players. All right, and so one player, one client says like, I'm gonna move the rooks, the rook hopper, like, you know, 10 squares up or something like that. And then the PHP, like, it's, it's very basic. It just verifies like, is that even a legal move? And then if it is, it's like, oh, okay. And then it stores that state in the database. It stores the game state for this particular session in the database, all right? So to be a little bit more uh, specific, the database will have like sessions, player sessions between multiple players. So there'll be a table of users, right? And then there'll be a table of sessions and that session will specify who the users are. And then it'll have a set of game states or moves or something like that. And that'll be also a separate table and they're all interconnected. And it's really not that complicated. You can learn SQL in like, I don't know, eight hours. It depends on uh, how far along you are in your programming. It's, it's really not all that complicated. So even less time than that potentially. So the point is that, yeah, and the game is just, the whole game exists inside of this, this database, just sitting here. And then when the next player comes over, they're like, I've got to move, yeah! And it, like, you know, moves a penguin, a pawn, oh golly. Um, it does the same thing. It's like, I just move it, and then the database, it just updates the, the game state, and then it sends both, whoop, whoop, the game state to the, each player. And so that they both have the same copy of the, of the game state. Now, this whole thing can really go further than just Penguin Chess. It's just a little bit trickier. So, for example, let's say that you're going to be creating a game called Snowball Fight, right? Something like that. Remember that game? Snowcraft, where he plays like three little children, like throw snowballs at each other. That was fun. That game probably doesn't exist anymore. It was probably like 
flash at best. All right, so snowball fight. And in this game, you got your penguin. It's like, and then here's the penguin. It's got its little face. And that doesn't look like a penguin at all. Folks, don't let me draw. All right. And there's like a hill. And you, have you ever played that game, Worms? It's, it's, so it's like that. So that you got this game where there's this penguin. And it's like, hooray. It's got its little arm. It's got little eyes. And it's got a beak. And these penguins throw snowballs at each other, right? So it's like Worms. Right, so each player takes turns, but it's more complex than like penguin chess because it's less deterministic because it's physics based, right? It's like how do you keep track of like if someone throws a snowball that the physics world can be uh, that the simulation, the physics simulation, will um, have exactly the same consequence as it's played back on the player. On the other player's uh, machine. So, like in, pen in in penguin chess, you you just say like the, the player's actions, like do this action, do this action, do this action, and save that in the deba database. Well, the, the the actions in Snowball Fight are a little bit more complex, right? Potentially, like you might store like okay, um, for this play this this player's turn, they like move forward, you know, like for five seconds, like up this hill, and then here's the little like where they end up being. And then they launch a snowball, you know, at this magnitude, like, and then so the snowball then comes over here, and then it, like, hits the enemy's player and blows up some of the ground, whatever the heck these, like, snowball grenades are like. And so, like, sure, what the, the, the database is going to remember is the sequence of actions that the player performed, right? That can be essentially, like, the ghost data for that particular action, where the player just goes up the hill, a little bit launches the snowball and then it will replay it through the physics simulation on the other game the the other clients um you know game the other gamers game um well here's the problem like physics is like you know depending on these like highly precise variables like you know floating point variables in this world it's maybe not going to happen exactly the same way and so always coupled with this like set of actions you would also remember the state of the game after that turn was over like you know the enemy like this particular penguin had like you know 63 health left like the radius of the damage was exactly like this like you store the entire game state of the in of the level and it's really not that much data right you store each game state um after every turn so that like sure you watch the whole like ooh he launches the uh, launches the snowball and it does this whole thing you know fun stuff but then at the end of the turn it's always going to end up so that they have synced exact game states between the different players the problem with this is it is a little bit harder to check for cheating you know you can still do it but it's a little bit trickier but you still don't need to dive in deep with like all this advanced netcode stuff you still just can come here in the server and say like, okay, I trust you, and then just grab this information, do some very basic, you know, cheating detection, and then just store that state in the database and send it over to the other client, and you're done. And so it's, again, relatively simple. If that doesn't sound simple to you, then trust me, your, like, magnum opus game is going to have to wait a little. Um because it's, 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 it's a lot more complicated to do the other stuff. So, coming back, what the heck time are we at right now? Okay, we're good, we're doing pretty well. All right, so, um, but let's say that the uh, game designer's like, no bueno, this is not good enough for me. I don't want this turn-based trash. I never played turn-based games growing up. Forget it. In fact, whenever someone's like, let's play a card game, I would just go real-time on them. You know, it's like war, I'm just going to throw cards at them, and they'll just have to deal with it. Um, anyways, but, so it's, it has to be re real-time, concurrent, active multiplayer, well, drafts. We've gotten into that situation where it's like, it's unavoidable, that's what you want, that's fine, you know, I can't talk you down, but I can talk you down a little, okay? Because let's say that you are going whole hog, you are gonna actually rely on, um, this server that is running, continuously updating the game state, you know, continuously every you know, fraction of a second, right? So you're not, so let's say you're, you're saying like, nah, I'm not doing this PHP server stuff. And you still might, 
if you're like doing a sign in and stuff like a lot of these like MMOs and stuff like that, um, like will have the server instance like running a session of the game with multiple players who are connected at the same time, you know, the whole, that expensive stuff. But it still has the server. It still has this like PHP business, you know, and database to store uh, to, 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 re to remember like an inventory. Right. Because that doesn't get remembered on the dedicated server that's just running the game and governing all of the player actions. It doesn't remember like your inventory or your players like upgrades between games or that kind of stuff. That still gets needs to get put in a database. Okay, so you're still gonna have to have this. So if you thought you were gonna avoid it, no, you're probably still gonna have, to have a little bit of that, right? So it's, it's you can't totally avoid it. So might as well just do this if you you know if you if you can if you can help it. But anyways, let's say that you want to make a game, and so here's some tips on. Okay, you want to make your uh, uh, com uh, your uh, concurrent, active multiplayer game with your server and all that business, um, registering up you know updates to the game state every fraction of a second. Great, fine. But here's a list of things to consider to make it a lot the heck easier to write this code. All right, so let's say that, and we always have to have an example, right? So we got a lot of examples this time, okay? Um, let's say you're gonna make a game called Cold Blood. Cold Blood, or something like that, right? It's a, it's a penguin game, in fact, in case you didn't know. And in this particular penguin game, it's kind of like Metal Slug. You remember that game, Metal Slug? So you got your angry penguin, it's like, and he's wearing a bandana. Pretty cool. And this penguin uh, <clears throat> has a, you know, assault rifle. <laughs> you know, one of these kinds of giant weapons. Very good. Here's our penguin. And it's co-op. Huge. It's important to recognize <laughs> because it makes it a lot a lot less at stake. So it's co-op. So you got you got the the one with the assault rifle, and then you've got the other penguin with the you know it's also an angry penguin. But this penguin has uh, a uh, party hat because this penguin's kind of crazy. All right, I guess that's a party hat. And this is kind of a weird looking penguin. It's kind of got the frills. Um, but this penguin's got you know freaking grenades, right? Who's going to be the grenade penguin and who's going to... Oh, I don't know. Who cares? Maybe they both can do both. Anyway, so here's the point. There's your penguins. That's the worst. Anyways, but the in this particular game, Cold Blood, um, it's a co-op game. So here's one thing. Since it's not competitive, um, it makes it so that the stakes are lower in terms of, like, uh, you know, feeling cheated by, you know, lag or something like that. Because... Um, you're not playing competitively against each other. You're just helping each other out. That's one thing. Second thing, okay, so I'm going to say co-op will make it easier. Second thing is you can do what we would call a client server. That sounds like not real. What? I thought you were saying the client and the server were the two different things. Oopsie. Uh, there's the client and then there's the server. Well, guess what? In case you didn't know, the client can be the server also. So instead of paying for a, you know, Amazon web services, you know, all that kind of fun stuff, you can just say like, hey, instead of doing that, I'm going to have the instance of the server that's like validating everything and updating the game state for everybody on the client. <laughs> We're just going to have you run it. Ha ha. Free ride. <laughs> Free loading on, on the player. Um, have you ever played a game where, like, when someone quits, it's like migrating host or some trash like that? That's that's a client server, right? The peer-to-peer, -peer, not dedicated server situation. Yeah, it's where they're just, um, let's say player one is the client server, right? So this is the server. And then player uh, two is like, I am going to send you an update to the input that I want to to log. And then this client's like, thank you. Thank you for that. I'm going to update the game state, and I'm going to send you back my, you know, new position and direction and the state of the game, right? However, this player, player one, is the one that validates everything, is like, you know, the final say on what the actual game state is. Everyone else just sends the information like, hey, 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 this is what I want, this is what I want. And then the, then the server, in this case, the client server, is like, 
That's unfortunately not possible <laughs> because you're already dead. Sorry. Um, and then sends that information back being like, sorry about you, you're dead. And like, why? Like, because I said so on the server. So, of course, in that situation, it's really bad for cheating because this little fella, <laughs> player one, can, being the host, can cheat the heck out of the world by saying like, oh, this is the game state. And it's like, but that game state means that I'm dead for no reason. It's like, well, that's the state of the game. Too bad. Um, you're giving <laughs> this player like full autonomy over like what the, the state of the world is. Dictator player one. All right. Um, but here's the thing. You can do a client server for multiple reasons um, in this particular case. One reason is the cheating, you know, is not as big of a deal. Less impact, impact for cheating, right? So if someone's cheating, it's like, well, what? Like, it's a co-op game, right? The, the, just tell your friend, like, stop doing that. Like, come on, the game's more fun when you don't cheat, right? And then it's, then, you know, that's between them. The other thing is that the host migration process is, like, not as much of an issue because you're playing co-op, right? It's not like some random person is, you know, in a, the other side of the level, you don't even know who they are or that you're even playing with them is the host. And then they drop out and like suddenly everything breaks and it's like host migration. It doesn't even succeed and the game crashes. Well, if that happened and like one of the players in your co-op game, you know, leaves and there's a host migration, it's like, well, you're just turning it into a single player game at this point. And if the game crashes, who cares, right? Host migration, less of an issue because both of you are going to be in the same game for the same amount of time usually, and so it's not a not a big issue. So two problems solved pretty much right off the bat. Host migration is tricky, by the way. <laughs> you know, if you're going to do this whole like uh, co-op thing, then maybe if the player leaves, it's like they left, and then just don't even just close the game, regardless of if they're the host or not. All right. Um, uh, what else? Well, let's make it so that. Certain things are the case. First of all, let's okay make it that um, player characters walk. That's an interesting way of spelling walk through each other, right? Um, that's one way to solve problems because the lag isn't much of an issue. If you walk through each other, it's like who cares? Like you, you never, you're not blocking each other. So there's less of a problem with like, you know, someone being in your way or like someone has like really bad latency as in they're lagging bad. And so it's like, why can't I walk through you? It's like, oh, your position isn't updated. And there's all sorts of weird jumping and snapping and other issues. That's less of an issue if you just can walk through each other. Who cares? Because your other players aren't like interrupting your play. Um, what else can you do to basically make it so that lag where there might be a desync problem as in client two and client one have a different idea of what the game state is okay and that's because there's lag like the, you haven't synchronized the game state yet and if there's a lot of lag then that synchronization problem can be much more obvious and that can be a problem so and to prevent that issue um or to make it less uh significant or make it matter less then just think about what are ways to avoid that being much of a problem so one way to do it is uh Make it that it doesn't matter who kills the enemy or the boss. Like, there's not one character that's like, haha, you did it, so you get more score or something like that. Or, like, the one who kills the boss gets the loot, and, you know, it's like, what? I thought I killed the boss. Like, how did you get the loot? Right? Just make it so it's just like, oh, we did it! We killed the boss together! You know, and who cares? Right? Just like the health bar goes down, and it's like not clear who's making the health bar go down. It's just like, you know, we're just blasting the enemy, and eventually it'll die. And if it doesn't matter, if it, if it dies like half a second earlier on someone else's machine, it doesn't matter. Good enough. Um, also, loot, right? Uh, make it so that, like, no fighting over loot or pickups. Okay? Like, don't make it so that there's, like, an upgrade that only one person can get. Like, whoever touches it first, no, that's going to lead to problems, right? Because then whoever, like, la was, you know, not the host was had less of a chance of getting the loot before the other people. You know, or did I say that backwards? Anyways, the host is, you know, has the advantage. Always. Pretty much. Um, not always, but in this case, yeah. Okay, so no fighting over loot. Just make everyone get the loot, right? Just, you know, oh, there's an upgrade. Everyone pick it up and everyone gets it, right? So basically make it as much of like a single player, single player plus plus. 
basically make it like that. So it's like you're basically single player, but you're just your friends helping you and isn't in any which way interfering or reducing your um, uh, interactive experience, right? That's all, yeah, yeah. And then it's easy because you basically just have two single player games that are running mostly at the same time <laughs> and that they're synchronizing. Um, and that's all you have to do. Just synchronize some very basic things so that you can see where the player, the end of, your, your, your friend is and like what they're shooting approximately. And there's no one's going to complain about it. Okay, just do that. That like, and I'm not saying like definitely just do that. But if you, if you, I'm just trying to help you think about how to design your game in such a way that it's the least amount of impact and hairiness to, to get through the network programming. Okay, if you do it this way, it's really not very, very difficult at all because you can be really messy and it's not going to make that much of a, a difference. Still going to be expensive to pay for server space unless you do that uh, client host situation. <clears throat> client server type of thing where the client uh, acts as the server. Okay, shoot. But then, um, and I'm not going to go over this too much, but let's say that like the player is like, no, you know, the only the fun games people play nowadays are Fortnite and Among Us and Fall Guys, and I don't know if this video is going to age poorly. Anyways, <laughs> you know, it's one of those types of games. Okay, you can't talk about it. Uh, that's what they want to make. And well, in that case, it's like, well, you're just going to have to deal with it. <laughs> so uh, we're going to do one more game just so that we can have it. This one is going to be called uh, Find Your Mate. Because penguins like to do that, right? Isn't that what happens in um, what is it called? The one with uh, Morgan Freeman. Is it Morgan Freeman? I don't even know. Uh, Happy Feet? No, it isn't. Walk of the, the, the Penguins? Anyways, who cares? Find Your Mate Battle Royale. Ha <laughs> ha Battle, there's an E at the end, right? Battle Royale, find your mate. It's a dating sim crossed with a Battle Royale game, right? And so in this particular game, there's like a field of penguins. What is that called, a group of penguins? They're called like a, a waddle. I don't know what they're called. Anyways, and so you got like, you know, just like penguin, 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 right? There's a bunch of penguins, just like all over, and they all have little beaks, let's say. Beak, 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 beak. And uh, in this particular game, there's 100 players, right? Or 99, however many is in a Battle Royale nowadays. 100 players, and um, you have one teammate. And the whole goal of the game is just find your teammate. Just if you can get to your teammate, then you win, right? And everyone spawns all over the map, and, uh, and everyone looks exactly the same. And um, the chat is horrible. Everyone's in the chat at the same time. <laughs> so it's like, hey, I'm here. Oh my gosh, I can't hear you. Turn off the mic. Uh, turn off your sound. It's the worst. Uh, must be like that for the, the freaking penguins. Um, penguin simulator. But in this particular game, it's, it's a lot higher stakes, right? Because you're not friendly with the other penguins. Like, right? If you, you want to win and you've tried to find your other mate, but you can freaking kill other penguins on your way, right? So it's, it's a battle royale, right? You, you know, you set up traps. You, you know, they'll tell the leopard seal over there, right? You know, whatever you need to do. <laughs> And in this particular game, right, it's 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 a it's a live action, real time, concurrent, competitive multiplayer game where players are able to like run into each other and you know hide behind cover and do all this stuff. Holy moly, you have bought in to something very very uh, complex and stuff. And there's a million videos for you to check out to see exactly what that means. That it's a lot of trouble, uh, a lot of a lot of work. I don't want to tell you no. I just want to let you know that if this is the kind of game that you want to make, then yeah, then we can ignore all the other things that I talked about. Um, right. So there's all sorts of different things when you're dealing with this kind of game. For for instance, to make it a little bit better. Um, to avoid like, you know, how the cl the players are like just chop, 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 because, you know, the updates of the, the, of the, from the server are not like, you know, every millisecond, right? They're, they're, but they're, they're fast, but you know, some of these players are slow and there's packet loss, right? Because you're using UDP. We're not going to talk about that. TCP, UDP, you look it up. Um, there's packet loss and there's all sorts of problems like that. So what you can do is there's this thing called server input. The eyes giving out on my keyboard. Input per it's really giving out. It's dying. All right, <laughs> my poor Philco. All right, uh, that's a keyboard. Anyway, input uh, server input prediction. Basically, what happens is the server is like, yeah, we'll let you, you know, 
try to move your character forward and we'll let you think that that's what's happening <laughs> you know we're going to show it to you automatically we'll say like hey fine yeah your player just character just moved forward a little bit and then what happens is the server then catches up with what the player has said it's like i want to do this and then the player will immediately do that and then the server will be like oh okay the player did this so i'm going to now relay that to the, all the other people so now everybody is a little bit behind <laughs> right because the player this particular client like this particular penguin is over here uh on this particular player's side no one else knows it <laughs> right because there's this input you know the server input prediction uh, so it's immediate response for the player they're able to be here no one else sees it okay if you didn't have the server input prediction then everyone would see what everyone's location is essentially at the same time well minus like the differences and how long it takes for the other people to get that information um and then the server catches up it, the game state to reflect what the player thinks that they can do well here's the thing with these dedicated servers they're the boss okay they're everybody's favorite thing what's everybody's favorite thing besides like ice cream uh the government right that's everybody's favorite thing um it generally the server lets players do whatever they want um, but they'll spy on you uh, on every single thing you do and authorize every action that you make, okay, and make sure that it's correct. <laughs> okay, that's how it does it. Um, and the dedicated server is doing that to make sure there's no cheating and all this kind of stuff and that everyone gets the game state. Every single significant action, like that's not just cosmetic, every single action like where the player is and what the player did and where the player shot a weapon or whatever it is, is authorized and processed on the server end, which means that the server the dedicated server is running essentially an instance of the game. A special instance of the game doesn't have that doesn't have visuals or you know render anything, but it does keep track of every single player's information and every single aspect of the game so that when some player starts cheating, the dedicated server knows it because the dedicated server is running the game software. The de dedicated server is like, yeah, you can't do that. Yeah, I know you think you can do that, but you can't. And with this input prediction kind of business, it's like, it seems great. It makes the game feel smooth, but then there's all these types of problems where you like, you know, jump out of the corner and shoot somebody. And then on their screen, it looks like you died instantaneously by like a, a, a weapon that shouldn't be killing them because the weapon shoots like 30 shots in like one second and they got the update all in that one second, you know what I mean? Or like, you know, half of a second, it just seems like you died instantly from a weak weapon and that they just like appeared out of nowhere. But that's because the server was like, oh, the player wanted to do that, and so um, we're going to let them do that. And that seemed like a valid action, whether this other player seemed like it was valid or not. Good enough. Like, it's a compromise. It's a huge compromise, and it's hugely complicated. I don't want to get into the mess here because there's all sorts of videos about it, but I just want to point out that it's a magic to be able to get this to feel right because we aren't sending information faster than the speed of light, okay? <laughs> It's not. There's going to be latency. And so this multiplayer is not happening the way that it looks like it's happening. It just isn't. Okay? It's a lie. It's a big illusion. All right? If it showed you exactly what is actually happening from the server end in real time, it would look choppy and horrible and it would be a terrible, unplayable experience. So you basically use magic, hard, very difficult to control and maintain and get perfect magic between the players and your magic has to be particularly strong the force must be strong in you as a network programmer the more of this stuff you're not doing <laughs> right the more you're depending on fast-paced competitive you know you're using a dedicated server you're not using the clients that are expensive the players can run into each other they fight over things that is where it is the hardest to do so just keep all of that in mind as you decide on what kind of game you want to make and what type of stuff you need to do. That's all I have for today. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you liked it, then please subscribe, uh, leave a comment, uh, like the video, um, and catch you next time.